Now this question is going to become very important. Jesus, imposter or Messiah? It's a very important question because this Jesus lays claims to some astounding things. He says for example, I am the way, the truth and the life. How many come to the Father? No, no one comes to the Father except by me. That's what he says. And today this Jesus is being marginalized and the critics and especially what they call the New Reformation movement is disseminating the Bible and ripping the heart out of the messianic side of the Bible. Jesus must, if we want to have world unity of religions, become one on a level with all the others. Isn't that right? He cannot stand out above anyone else. He has to come down to the level of all the others. But if this Jesus Christ is the Messiah of God and is God, well then we are going to come up to an impasse. So let's have a look what the Bible says because I don't want to influence you. Jesus, imposter or Messiah. Jesus says in John 6 verse 38, for I came down from heaven. Well, that's not everyone who can say that, right? That's not something usual. I can't say that. So, either this is presumption or it is truth. Evidence that demands a verdict, a book by Joss McDowell, he says some skeptics have suggested that these prophecies, the prophecies about Jesus and the messianic prophecies, were accidentally or coincidentally fulfilled by Jesus. According to the science of probability, the chance of any one human being up until recent present fulfilling a selection of just eight of these prophecies, including the one on the crucifixion, is one in ten to the power of seventeen. And here we are considering only eight prophecies. What if we were to consider forty-eight prophecies? The chance would then become virtually zero at 1 to the power times 10 to the power of 157. And you must remember that the number of particles as designed, defined by science in the entire universe is only 10 to the power of 80. So this is the number of particles in billions upon billions upon billions ad infinitum universes. Wow! What about all 61 prophecies? I believe there are even more than 61 prophecies. And every single one of them is fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Numbers 24, 17 says, There shall come a star out of Jacob. He would be preceded by a messenger. I'm just going to run through a few of them. I'm not going to even make a big deal out of this. I want to come to a particular prophecy tonight. So we'll briefly run through some of these ancient prophecies. Isaiah 40 verse 3, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So the Bible predicts that he will be preceded, the Messiah, by a messenger. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3 verses 1 to 3. So he was preaching this very message predicted by the Messiah. In John chapter 8 verse 36 it says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. It's a very important prophecy. So according to the statement by Jesus, freedom comes through Christ and through no one else. Because he says no one comes to the Father except by me. The Jews answered, We are Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou that we will be made free? He was talking of freedom from bondage, freedom from sin. My kingdom is not of this world. John 18 verse 36. I mean these are astounding claims. The miraculous birth, behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Not just anyone, God with us. You'll say but he wasn't called Emmanuel, he was called Jesus. Well you see in ancient times 
The name referred to something. It had a meaning. It wasn't just an objective name. It had a meaning. So Emmanuel means God with us. Joshua, which is translated in the Greek as Jesus, means Yahweh the Savior. God the Savior. And Jesus laid claim to being God. Therefore, he's not on a par with anyone in any religious system. That's Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. And the angel said to her, You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you shall give him the name Jesus. Which is exactly the same as Emmanuel. Yahweh, the Savior, is here. In other words, God with us. Luke 1, 28, 31. And then the Old Testament says, Bethlehem, Bethlehem, out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Micah 5 verse 2. And this particular Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrata, which means the bread basket, the bread of life would come down and be born in Bethlehem. And of course we know that that was also fulfilled. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the time of Herod and he was given the name Joshua Yahweh the Savior. Jesus said, the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. But this is an Old Testament prophecy as well. Bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord to comfort all that mourn. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. So there's a prophecy that's fulfilled. Luke 4, 18 and 19 tell us that that is exactly what Jesus claimed for himself. Isaiah proclaims that the Messiah would work through miracles, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, then shall the lame man leap like a heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing, and the New Testament, Matthew tells us, Luke tells us, he went about healing all manner of diseases. To appoint unto them that mourn in, in Zion the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, Isaiah 61, 3. In the Psalms we read that the Messiah would open his mouth in parables. I will open my mouth in parables. All these things Jesus spoke in parables. The Bible predicts a triumphant entry. And we have it there in Zechariah, Thy king cometh unto thee just and having salvation, lowly and riding on an ass. All these things are predictions in the Old Testament. My close friend whom I trusted and shared my bread with has lifted up his heel against me, that he would be betrayed. is fulfilled, and we read it in Matthew, that Judas Iscariot did precisely that. What about this one, Zechariah 11? Verses 12 and 13. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Even the price that was paid for this deception is listed in the Old Testament. And they took 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And that's exactly what they did. They bought the potter's field because they wouldn't take the money which was death money. Jesus went to the chief priests and they said to him, What? Will you give me and I will give him unto you? And they gave him, what, 30 pieces of silver. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. And what did they do? They bought the potter's field. Every single little detail I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. The sufferings that Jesus went through, unbelievable. I did not hide my face from the mocking and spitting. He was tried seven times. Seven times. Once by Annas, and he was struck in the face right there. Caiaphas and Annas, the night trial, the morning trial, the, the trials with the Roman officials. Then he was sent to Herod, back to Pilate. Seven times he was tried. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 6. They spit in my face, they buffeted him, smote him with palms. They said, and the Bible says, they hit him over the head again and again and again. They hate me without cause, Psalm 69, that he would be rejected. 
Predict it in the Bible. They hated me without cause. John. He was oppressed and was afflicted. He opened not his mouth. He brought, was brought like a lamb to the slaughter. Everything there in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a testimony to Jesus Christ. And when he was accused of the chief priests and the elders, he answered nothing. Just like a lamb to the slaughter. Matthew 27, 12. And they wagged their heads. They shook their heads and said, look at this guy. Where's he come from? He was numbered with transgressors. They gave him vinegar to drink. Psalm 69, 21. Matthew 27, 34. Were crucified with thieves. You know that that was the case. Mark 15. Zechariah. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. Even the way of the crucifixion. And he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12. Beautiful prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus. Luke 23, 30, 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Every single aspect about the Messiah was predicted and is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They divided my garments amongst them, and for my clothing they cost lots. People say, why did he say then, my God, my God, why did thou forsake me? Because it was predicted in Psalms 22 verse 1. Jesus died the death of total separation for you and for me. They pierced my hands and my feet, Psalms 22 16. Even to down to that detail, the predictions are there. Psalms 31 5, verse 5, the last words that he would speak, Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Father, into thy hand I commit my spirit. Everything there in the Old Testament. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Psalms 34 20. That was already a typology with a lamb, with a Passover lamb. It was to be eaten, but not a bone was to be broken. Why? because the Messiah's bones would not be broken. It was the preparation and the Jews were afraid that they would come down and run away and they didn't want to chase after them on the Sabbath day because they had hordes and hordes of rules written in their Talmud. And so they gave the order that they should break the legs. That's what the New Testament says. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead, so they did not break his legs. Fulfilling the prophecy, John 19, 32, verse 33. And they pierced his side. So, the place of his birth is predicted, the manner of his birth is predicted, his betrayal is predicted, and the manner of his death is predicted. In great detail, we've just flown over them. We haven't even gone into the detail. The nuances, the finer details, absolutely astounding. Here's a beautiful statement. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as He deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which He had no share, that we might be justified by His righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was His. With His stripes we are healed. Beautiful statement. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isaiah 53 again says, His grave would be with the wicked. Very interesting. And that with the rich in His death, so He died with the wicked, and a rich man gave Him the grave. And Matthew 27 verse 57 and 60 confirms that very statement. So the manner of his death, the way he was buried, everything there in the Old Testament. Some of the critics said, well hang on a second, maybe he wasn't a historic figure after all. Maybe the New Testament writers just wrote all that stuff down to make it look as if Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. Now, I hope you realize that the scribes and the Pharisees never understood the prophecies. Because otherwise they would have accepted the Messiah, right? So here, we have a story that all these things were changed. And they said that the individuals involved, like Pilate, weren't historic figures. Well, I have news for them, because here was a plaque that was found. It's on display at a museum in, in Israel, where the very names Tiberius 
and Pontius Pilatus are there, historic figures. Let's have a look at some of the historians. Tacitus, the Roman historian who lived AD 115, speaks about Nero's persecution of the Christians of the year AD 46, and he says, Christos from whom their name is derived, was executed at the hands of the procurator Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. So there's an extra biblical source which says when these things happened. Then you have Suetonius, the Roman historian, writing about AD 120, and he says since the Jews were continually making disturbances, remember that the Christians were counted as a Jewish sect, so they were called Jews, Disturbances at the instigation of Christos, he, Claudius, expelled them from Rome. And the Talmud, which is the Jewish traditions, said on the eve of the Passover they hanged Yeshu of Nazareth. So there are sources outside the scriptures which confirm the very issue. Jesus Christ was always central. The Messiah was always central to the religion of Israel. If you look at the sanctuary that had to be built, every single item, every single practice that occurred within this sanctuary is a reference to Christ. The most beautiful story of the plan of salvation is enacted here in the sacrifice of the Lamb, which stood for the Lamb that would take away the sins of the world. If you go on into the sanctuary, there was the labor of washing, where you are washed by the consequences of your action of confessing your sins. Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, the intercessor. Jesus Christ, the mercy. Everything is there. It's a beautiful story. We haven't got time into it. Even in the typology of the high priest, the high priest stood for Jesus Christ. He was a type because Paul says we have such a high priest. Jesus Christ, the one who entered into the majesty of heaven. Hebrews 8 verse 1 and 2, we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Very interesting stuff. For Christ not entered the holy places made with hands which are the figure of the true. So that was the figure of the real thing. This was just a type. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. He entered into heaven itself. Hebrews 9 verse 24. The whole Old Testament was a typology of the very acts of Jesus. So now we are faced with a problem. The world is going to expect very soon that everybody acknowledges equality of all. But the Bible says there is only one way to salvation and that is through Jesus Christ. And that Jesus was not one of many prophets in this world but that he was the predicted Messiah the God-man, the one who would come down from heaven to pay the price for sin for your and my salvation. And we have to know where we stand. Well, there's a fantastic prophecy in Daniel which has put this issue beyond a shadow of doubt. So much so that it is a nightmare for those who want to reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. In Daniel chapter 8, we have also a flow through history like we did in Daniel chapter 2 now, when we did the head and the, and the arms of silver and the bronze and the iron. But here, the whole issue is repeated in terms of animals. And you have here a particular goat with two horns, one larger than the other, and the Bible tells us who it is. We don't have to guess. It's a reference to the Medes and the Persians and it tells us that while these horns were there another goat came along with a prominent horn between his eyes and we again we don't have to guess in Daniel chapter 8 it tells us who the horn is a horn is a king or a kingdom it says the prominent horn between his eyes is the first king of Greece so who was it? Alexander the Great 
We don't have to guess. The Bible tells us exactly what these symbols stand for. And it says he approached and he attacked the two horned one and broke off the horns. Medo-Persia was conquered. So there he comes flying, crashes into the other one, breaks off his horns. And Daniel 8, 8 says, Therefore the goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. So, Alexander the Great would come to his end. And in its place, four notable ones would come up towards the winds of heaven. And we know that Greece was divided into four regions. Interesting, there were twelve generals fighting over it. But after those battles, there were just four regions. And out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great towards the south and towards the east and towards the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon it. Yea, it magnified himself even to the prince of hosts. And by him the daily sacrifices there written cursively. So it wasn't in the original text. That's what it means. In the King James Version, when they write it cursively, it means it's not in the original. So by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now this whole sanctuary stood for the Messiah. And Rome came along and crucified the Messiah. Then I heard one saint, now he's in vision and he's hearing an angel speak to another one, speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision? concerning the daily sacrifice added, by the way, the daily, which is the tamid. The tamid is the continual. That was that fire that was burning. When they looked at it, the fire meant that the sacrifice was always available, the atonement of Christ. We can come to that in a later lecture. And the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, and now we have a time prophecy, unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel 8, 13 and 14. We have a time prophecy. Now we're not going to deal with this prophecy tonight, this two thousand three hundred day prophecy. We'll deal with it in another evening, in detail. So I don't want to go into this into detail, but he is discussing a particular time prophecy. And I want to look at a portion of this time prophecy. Daniel 8, 23, 26, And in the latter time of their kingdom, a king of fierce countenance and understanding, dark sentences shall stand up. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. There you have the without hand again. Thunderous prophecy. We're going to deal with it. And we're going to see who's going to be in control just before Christ comes. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true, therefore shut up the vision for it is for many days, for the future. He said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So here is a, a vision that Daniel is given and he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand it at all and he's told, don't worry, you don't have to understand it. It concerns the distant future and it will be unsealed at a later stage, but not now. And we're not going to deal with this in this lecture. In another lecture, we'll come to it. So he's thinking about this vision. And he doesn't understand it. So here he's standing, Daniel 8, 17. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. So he's in vision. And he sees this heavenly being falls on his face. Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. So the vision concerns the future, concerns the time of the end. And it has so many aspects to it that bother Daniel. And then in Daniel chapter 9, from verses 20 onwards, we have an explanation of part of the vision. So while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, this is the, the angel Gabriel, came to me in swift flight and he said to me, O Daniel, I have now come out to give you wisdom and understanding. 
So now he's going to explain something to him, and we want to know what it's about. And here we go. Fasten your seat belts. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. How many days in a week? Seven. Seven. So seventy weeks would be seventy times seven. We'll come to that days. So seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. That's the Jews. And upon thy holy city. Which one is that? Jerusalem. To finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Daniel 9 verse 24. Thunderous vision. Thunderous prophecy. So 70 weeks are determined, cut off for this particular time, from this particular time period, and all these things must be accomplished. End of sins, reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness. Now who did all that? Who brings in everlasting righteousness? Who can make an end to sin? Only Jesus. This is a messianic prophecy. Now let me tell you, the Jews are very upset about this prophecy. Listen to this. This is the rabbinic curse. The rabbinic curse. And you will find it in Talmudic Law, page 978, section 2, line 28. Let me read it to you. May the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to find out the time of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And may his memory rot from off the face of the earth forever. Wow, these guys mean business. Would you agree? So now I have to ask you something. Or what do the Americans say? Ask you something. Are you willing to go on in spite of that curse? Because if you are going to number with me, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, then this curse should theoretically s stick to us. But let me tell you something. I serve someone greater than this curse. Amen. I have no fear of this curse. Amen. And I know why they've got this curse. Because if this curse were not there, somebody might number that prophecy and find out whom they really should serve. Let's see. Cut off, determined, separated from. Seventy weeks cut off from the bigger prophecy for the Jews. Now let's look a look at it. In prophecy, a day counts for a year. A week counts therefore for seven days. So a day for the year, the day year principle, means that it counts for seven years. Now can I say that just by myself? Nope. That would be arrogance. So let's get some biblical support. Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6. I have pointed thee each day for a year. Talking about a prophetic sense. Or Numbers chapter 14 verse 34. After the number of days in which you search the land, even forty days each day for a year. So now the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. Let's apply, apply the day year principle and number the 70 weeks and see where we get. 70 weeks are appointed on your people. 70 weeks, well a week has 7 days. So how many days is that? That's 490 days. And that is therefore 490 prophetic years which are cut off. Cut off from what? Obviously the 2300 day prophecy, which he was talking about. So, that would bring us to 2300 years. 490 years cut off for the Jews. That's what it means. Alright, let's have a look a little further. Then the sanctuary would be cleansed at the end of that period. 
Now I'm going to deal with only this part of the prophecy tonight. Only this 70 week. In order to find out what this is about, we have to know when the prophecy starts, right? So when do these 2,300 years begin? From when do we start counting the 70 weeks, which the rabbinic code says we're not allowed to study? Well, Daniel 9 verse 24 gives us the answer. There's a curse upon this verse. Interesting, that rabbis should curse a part of Daniel. Does that puzzle you tonight? <laughs> it would certainly puzzle me if I were you, because it puzzled me like crazy. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto what? Messiah. Unto the Messiah. So from the going forth of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Remember Daniel is in captivity. Jerusalem is destroyed and now he's tiled 70 weeks. And you start counting when? From the time when the decree goes forth from the going forth of the decree, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks and the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. 9.25 Wow! He just received a messianic prophecy telling Daniel precisely when the Messiah would come. Did you know that? It's in the Bible. Did you know that? Well, let's work it out. Seven weeks, 49 days, 49 years. 62 weeks, 434 days, 434 years. Where does that bring us? The decree to restore and build Jerusalem. And then there would be seven weeks, Temple restored, and then Messiah the Prince. So what do we need? We need a date over here, and we can work it out. Is that right? We need a date. Ida Sexus, king of Persia, issued the decree in the year 457 BC. This decree was total political freedom again for the Jews. There was a Cyrus decree previously which pertained only to the temple. But this decree, Artus Sexus, 457 BC, pertains to the restoration of Jerusalem. There we go. So we have a starting date. So 457 plus 483, that's the 49 plus the four, uh, 434, brings us to the year... A.D. 27. Now what happened in A.D. 27? 69 weeks, 43, one day for a year. I've appointed you a day for a year, remember? Day for a year. And let's look at the decree. Ezra 7, 12 and 13. Artus Sexus, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, I make a decree that all they which of the people of Israel, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. That was the decree. And I, Artaxerxes king, do make a decree to all the treasurers that are beyond the river that whatever Ezra the priest shall require of you, it be done speedily. Ezra 7.21 And by the way, an archaeological tablet has been found confirming the date 457 BC, so it's beyond the shadow of doubt. There can be no argument about the date. It's found written in stone. 457, 490 years. The total prophecy is 2,300 years. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to rebuild unto the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now seven plus 62 is how much? That's 69 weeks. The total prophecy concerns how many weeks? 70. So there's another week to go. But the prophecy says that Messiah which means anointed one will come after the 69 weeks and that worked out to which year do you remember? 27 A.D. 
So the decree went out 457, 69 times 7, 483 days. And total restoration. That was only that particular decree unto the Messiah. So 27 AD, the Messiah. Now how old was Jesus when he started his messianic ministry? He was 30. Now why 27 AD? Here's a problem. 30 and 27, they don't add up. Ah! But go to any little encyclopedia, even a children's encyclopedia, and you will see that our time has been shifted and that the whole period is really out by these four years. You don't count the zero year and that Jesus was actually 30 in the year 27 AD. The word Messiah means anointed one and when Jesus was anointed that happened at his baptism. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, this is quoting the scriptures, when all the peoples were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying to heaven, praying the heaven was open. Luke 3, 1 and 21. Now that year of Tiberius was 27 AD. Now, how many messiahs can there be? Only one. Only one that fulfills every single prophecy. The 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was 27 AD and Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit precisely on time. Now can you imagine now why the rabbin rabbinical Talmud said, Cursed be the one who numbers the 70 weeks? Because Judaism would come to an end. If they accepted what Daniel said, Judaism would come to an end. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which says, Thou art my beloved Son in thee. I am well pleased. Now, listen to what it says in Mark chapter 1 verse 15. Jesus was just anointed. The year was 27 AD. And he says and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent thee and believe the gospel. Mark 1 15. Which time is fulfilled? Which time is fulfilled? John 1 29, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. The anointed one, the Messiah, was he there? God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, Acts 10 38. That took place at his baptism. So the going forth of the Messiah who would take the sins of the world upon him was predicted precisely in the Bible. The date. Galatians 4 verse 4 says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son. Which fullness of time? There was a prophecy that had to be fulfilled, and only Jesus fulfills it. Nobody else. And I'm going to put it straight out to you. Nobody else. No Shiva, no Brahma, no Vishnu, no Buddha, no Muhammad, no nobody. Jesus fulfilled it. No one else. So there is only one biblical Messiah. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. Amen. Now I was giving a lecture in Germany and I said that. And somebody got up in the audience and said to me, but that's arrogance. How can you say that nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ? That's arrogance. What about all the others? And I said, yeah, you're right. It sounds arrogant. To say, nobody does it except through this one particular individual. But if somebody comes up to me and he says to me, and I'm sitting there with my daughter, and he says to me, are you the father of that child? And I say, yep, I'm the father of that child. And he says to me, hey, out of all the billions of people on this planet, you say you're the father? That's arrogance. <laughs> 
Well, you know, folks, that might be arrogance, but it could also just be a fact. <laughs> right? Although my sister does say that fatherhood is an opinion and motherhood is a fact. <laughs> so we could perhaps argue the issue, but the fact of the matter, the point that I'm making, is if they, Jesus is the Messiah, and if Jesus is Emmanuel, if Jesus is the Joshua, the Yahweh, the Savior, then no one else qualifies, right or wrong? And if He is the Creator, there's no one else, right? So can I accept a hodgepodge? Or must I make a choice? What if I am told to bow down to someone else? Well, I have interesting news. In my country, in South Africa, they're bringing out new laws and new curricula. And these are going to be filtered throughout the whole world. The whole world is going to get them. And in our school system we have something called Curriculum 2005, which means that in the future our children must be trained in all religions, say all the prayers of all the other religions, and acknowledge the deities of all the other religions as well. I have a problem with that. So soon, I don't know, maybe there'll be this image and I'll have to say, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I can't go along with that. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, Galatians 4 verse 4. And what happens in the 70th week? You know, there are people that now, there are many prophetic ways that are out there in the world. And some take the 70th week and they throw it into the future, somewhere way out there. And they say, that pertains to the Antichrist. Now hang on a second, the 70 weeks pertain to the Jews to end transgression, to bring in ever righteous, everlasting righteousness. All of it was messianic. All of it was messianic. After three scores and two weeks, shall Messiah be, what does it say there? Cut off, but not for himself. What does that mean? He will die. But not for himself. For whom? For us. For us. Now this it gets exciting. It gets thunderously exciting. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. Now we have a chiasm. A beautiful chiasm talking about two forces at work. Messiah the prince and another one who comes and destroys the city. Who was he? That was the wrong. Rome came and destroyed the city, A.D. 70. So, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of shall be with a flood, and the end of the war desolations are determined, Daniel 9, verse 26. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. This is now... Messiah, the other ruler, Messiah. That's how the chiasm works. So, the Messiah will confirm a covenant with many for one week. But now note this. In the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Wow! How did the Messiah bring an end to the sacrificial system? He became the sacrifice. He became the sacrifice. So now we have the 70th week. Now folks, please think about this. The 70th week pertains still to the Messiah. That cannot be thrown into the future. Because in the middle of that week, by the way, the middle of seven is how much? And how long was Jesus active after his anointing? Three and a half years. And in the middle of that week he was cut off, but not for you and me. And he brought an end to the sacrificial system because he became the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Is that right? So only he can fulfill this part of the prophecy. Therefore, can I throw it into the future or does it pertain to the time of Christ? 
it pertains to the time of Christ. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. There is one prophetic week or seven literal years left in the prophecy. What is a half of seven? Three and a half. Three and a half years from the fall of 27 AD leads us to the spring of 31 AD. So we have 27, three and a half, and the sacrificial system of the Jews, which the temple stood for, comes to an end. Shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself? It's phenomenal. This ancient prophecy points to Jesus and to no one else, much to the disgust of many religious leaders in the world today. 70th week, 31 AD, Jesus dies, but there's still a three and a half left. Seventy weeks were determined upon the Jews. What happened in 34 AD? Now let me tell you something. Jesus said to the Jews, to these disciples, Go ye first to the lost children of what? Israel. Go ye first to the lost children of Israel. He didn't reject them even at his death. He said, Go ye first to the children, lost children of Israel. And they worked amongst the Jews. But then in 34 AD something happens. Something happened. They stoned Stephen. They stoned Stephen and the Christians fled. And who persecuted them? Who was sent after them? You remember? Paul. And Paul received a vision and he was made the apostle to whom? The Gentiles. Aha! Peter receives a vision of a sheet coming down filled with unclean things and he's sent to Cornelius, a Gentile. And he comes to Cornelius and he says, God has shown me in vision that I must not call any man unclean or impure. You know, he says to him, that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with a Gentile, but God has shown me in vision I can come to you. So AD 34, Stephen is stoned. The commission that the gospel would be carried forth by the Jews comes to an end and the Gentiles take the message further. They preach the risen Christ. Isn't that interesting? And any Jew that wants to be grafted into the vine can be grafted in. But he has to acknowledge Jesus Christ as his personal saviour and therefore become a Christian. And if you be in Christ, then you be Abraham's seed. Amen. That's how it works. Christ was crucified exactly on time according to the prophecy. Exactly as the prophecy foretold it would happen. And in the middle of the week he was crucified, but still mercy lingered until they totally rejected not only Christ, but his followers as well. According to the prophecy of Daniel's God covenant with the Jews would cease, 34 AD. And henceforth you have to be grafted into the vine. They preached and they were rejected. Here at the sheep's gate, this is where they brought him up, where they crucified the Savior. They wanted him as their king of kings, and they wanted him to destroy the Romans, but he came to destroy sin. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I had healed them. Hosea chapter 11 verse 3. I led them with cords of compassion, with bands of love, and I bent down to them and fed them. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you under my wings like a mother in her chicks, but you would not. Therefore your house is left to you desolate. The time when they would be the carriers of the gospel message would come to an end. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept. He wept. If you even you had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Why? Because of the hardness of their hearts. 
The days will come upon when, when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side and they will dash you to the ground and your children within the walls and they will not leave one stone upon another. Luke 19. Was it fulfilled? Yes. Look, your house is left to you desolate. So the gospel is carried to the, by the Gentiles. By the way, what does desolate mean? Does it mean there's something left or there's no light? No. Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. In the midst of the week, Christ the Messiah would cause the sacrifice to cease. These verses tell that the Messiah would die by crucifixion on the 14th day of the first Jewish month in the year AD 31. And every single detail has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Now note this. The Bible says in Mark 15, 38, And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Not from the bottom to the top. Uh-uh. From the top to the bottom. Who rent it? God. He tore it. Now when that veil tore, then the way to the Most Holy was open. Which meant any Jew could look into the Most Holy and live. Wow. Why? Because the sacrificial system had come to an end. Now think about this. Jesus fulfills the sacrificial system, yes or no? Yes. Because by one sacrifice he has forever made perfect. One sacrifice. What if I was to build a little temple and start sacrificing again? What would I be saying if I did that? that Christ was not sacrificed and did not fulfill everything. So if they want to build another temple, let them do it, but it is not from God. Amen. Are you with me on this or not? Amen. So the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, Matthew 27, 51. God saw to it that it is written down for us. So according to the prophecies of Daniel, God's covenant with the Jews would cease A.D. 34 at the end of the 70 weeks. And you cannot throw the 70th week into the future because the sacrificial system was ended by Jesus himself. So it fits back into the past. A.D. 34, the stoning of Stephen, the Jewish leaders reject the gospel and it goes to the Gentiles. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So in other words, everyone who accepts Jesus Christ is Abraham's seed. Yes or no? Yes. Because Paul says the seed refers to the singular, which means that it refers to Jesus Christ and to nothing else. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. Even the Israel of God. Who's that? The ones who accept Christ. That's who it is. So, I love the Jews. And I have many Jewish friends. And I really pray with all my heart that they will accept the gospel. And I hope there are many Jews here tonight. I'm not hammering the Jews here tonight, I'm discussing a prophecy. A prophecy that points to Jesus. And he said unto them, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. There's more to this prophecy, more to it. The cleansing of the sanctuary is a Jewish feast and we'll have to look at it. It was the day of judgment so it refers to Judgment Day at the end of time. End of the world. The prophecy will end 2,300 days later and then will come eternity. We all know that this earth was judged once before and destroyed by a flood and everybody who wasn't in the ark drowned. And in the same way Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they which testify of me. John 5 verse 39. In Jesus we have life. In Jesus we have saved. In Jesus we can go through to the kingdom. 
in no one else. And I want to warn the people of this country and all the countries of the world that this showdown is soon to take place. Serve the Lord and nobody will be lost. Thank you for coming.